Once upon a time, there was no happily ever after. Unlike modern twists on fairy stories where the villains might have some rational, albeit misguided motivation or redeeming qualities, there is no doubt as to the evilness of these characters. They make Disney baddies positively sugar spun in comparison. And speaking of Disney, after you see this, you'll never see this tangled hair brushing scene without shivers ever again. So do consider this a warning. Once upon a time, some thousands of years ago, a wealthy man and his pious wife had everything except for a child. In their yard grew a juniper tree under which the wife would pass her days. One winter, under her tree, she cut her finger while eating an apple, and her red, red blood fell onto the white snow. Morosely she sighed, If only I had a child as red as blood and as white as snow, which, yes, we've heard this before. As if she had cast a spell, her mood suddenly shifts and she feels certain a child is on the way. Months pass, the seasons change, the juniper berries grow, and eventually she, now extremely pregnant and blissful, gobbles them up by the mouthful. Juniper berries have been used in both medicine and in cooking, so some juniper berries are edible. Some are not. She soon falls gravely ill and, sobbing, asks her husband to bury her under the juniper tree if she should die. And of course, die she does, and buried here she is. But not before bringing the most beautiful baby boy, as red as blood and as white as snow, into the world. The new father and widower mourns, but of course does eventually marry again. He and his new wife bring a baby girl into this sad, sad story. And even though the mother loves her daughter, she only sees the Snow White Blood Red boy as a hindrance to her daughter's inheritance. This gnaws and gnaws at her, cutting her heart to the quick. And she eventually makes this child's life torture with her heavy-handed, well, hands and her evil ways. It gets worse. The evil one takes her over and this story gets very, very dark. One day, when the beautiful boy is at school, the sister asks her mother for an apple. Innocuous enough. The mother reaches into her heavy-lidded chest, the one with the razor-sharp iron lock, the story is very pointed and explicit about this, and pulls out an apple. Is brother not to have one too? The girl asks, which sparks anger in the mother at just the right or wrong moment, for she sees him walking home through her window right then. The evil one has come over her and she demands the apple back from her daughter. You won't get an apple before your brother, she says and presumably sends the girl away and waits for the boy to walk inside. My son, do you want an apple? She says to him, looking fierce and feral. Mother, how angry you look. Yes, give me an apple, he replies cautiously. Come with me, she says, opening the lid of the chest. Take out an apple for yourself. And while he was leaning over, she was again overcome and crash, down slams the lid and off flies the little boy's head, falling in among the red, red apples. Maybe I can get out of this, she thinks, a demented sense of logic flooding back. So she grabs a white scarf, props the boy's body up on a chair by the front door, places his head atop his neck, and ties it all together nicely and neatly with the scarf. Cruelly, she places an apple in his lifeless hand. The little sister enters the house to find her mother standing over a pot of boiling water, stirring slowly. Mother, brother is sitting at the door and he looks white. I asked him to give me the apple, but he did not answer me. I'm very frightened. Oh, poor, poor child. Go back to him, says the mother, and if he will not answer you, then box his ears. The obedient daughter does as she's told, and when her brother ignores her, she hits him and knocks off his head. Daughter, what have you done? yells the mother, but the poor girl is screaming and crying and beyond consolation. She's scarred for life. The mother lets her own daughter believe she killed the brother, and then says that they must tell no one, and it cannot be helped now, and so cooks his body in vinegar. The psychological damage is unreal. The mother cuts him up into pieces and turns this beautiful boy into stew. Oh, and makes her daughter help every step of the way. This poor girl cannot stop crying. She thinks this is her fault. The benefit of all that crying, naturally, is that the stew needed no salt on account of all the poor girl's tears streaming into it. Small consolation. The huge tureen of stew is brought out, but before eating, the father asks, Where is my son? The sister starts crying anew. The mother says, he's off visiting family and will be gone for quite a while. But don't worry, he's well taken care of and he wanted to go. <laughs> Yikes. The father is upset because the son didn't say goodbye to him. It isn't right, he says, and then eats the stew. 
The sister cries even more, to which he says, No need to cry, your brother will be back soon. Then, wife, this food is delicious, give me more. He chows through this macabre meal with gusto and finishes the whole tureen himself, saying, rather cryptically, Somehow I feel as if it were all mine. Hmm. And throwing all of his own son's bones under the table as he goes. That's, that's a whole human's worth of stew? Mother certainly knew how to make evidence, um, disappear. The sister cannot bear this and retrieves her nicest silken scarf to gather her brother's bones in. She brings this bony bundle to the juniper tree where she lays him to rest, sobbing tears of blood all the while, which sounds concerning. But then the tree sways like two hands clapping and a ghostly mist arise from within. Out of the center of the mist a fire blazes, and out of that flies the most magnificent bird with a voice so heartbreakingly beautiful. The silken bones have disappeared. The sister feels so inexplicably happy and reassured, like her brother rose from the dead and is now among the living again, that she went merrily into the house, sat down at the table, and ate. And I fervently hope there was something else for dinner, otherwise this is even grimmer. Before we get deeper into the dark details of this story, I want to mention the uncanny power in fairy tales of burying someone under a tree. It's not uncommon. In fact, you've probably heard one such popular tale already. In Cinderella or Ashputel, the original wife, Cinderella's mother, is buried either underneath the hazel tree or else one is planted atop of her gravesite. Hazel trees are said to be cloaked in power that imbue those who eat its fruit with wisdom and inspiration. Cinderella visits this often to cry, and it is here that she eventually encounters a pretty bird or magic that gives her the gorgeous dresses and shoes for the ball. Now, of course, in this story there are no extravagant dances. There's only death. Which is ironic given that juniper trees are traditionally viewed as healing or life-giving trees. But in the sense that juniper trees are regenerative and have the ability to bring things back, it fits really well with this story. The poor beautiful boy has been brought back in one form or another. Anyway, Revenant Brother Bird has come back for a bent revenge mission. He flies to a goldsmith's home where he sings his sad sweet song. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My little sister who loves me gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. Oh, so delightful and so incriminating. The goldsmith is so taken with this bird's uh, beautiful song that he asks, Please sing it again, sweet bird. No, I do not sing twice for nothing, says the bird who knows his worth, and so trades his song for a fine gold chain. The bird flies next to a shoemaker, sings his horrifying song, which delights the shoemaker into giving him a pair of red shoes in exchange for another round of My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me. Now, these are just regular shoes, although I'm sure they're pretty. They are not red hot iron shoes like the one Snow White forces her evil stepmother queen to dance the rest of her life away in. That would make this already brutal tale almost too kind. But you see, the Wing Revenant's next stop is to a mill. Here he sings his disturbing song for a bunch of mill workers crafting a millstone. They all love it, it's so beautiful, they say. Apparently no one is listening to the song's actual words because they are terrifying, and beautiful is the last thing I would be thinking. Investigate this mother and father and make sure this sister is safe, if anything, right? Anyway, they are so taken with the song and trade a whole big brand new millstone for another listen of My mother, she killed me. They place the stone around the little bird's neck and this bird's neck and wings must be otherworldly strong because I'm sure that thing weighs too much to fly easily away with and sing all the while. Collection assembled, the beautiful and undead buff bird goes home, where he sings his song once again. Now, this whole time, the mother has had a growing sense of impending doom, like there's fire in her veins and a terrible storm is coming to claim her. Some might say that's guilt she's finally feeling, but they'd be wrong. The remaining three family members are sitting at the table. The father feels so content and happy, in complete contrast to his wife's unease. The sister, who still thinks this is all her fault after all, is just sobbing uncontrollably. When they hear this devastatingly pretty song, the father rushes outside and feels as if he were about to meet some old acquaintance again. Which, well, yes he is. But this father is just so blissfully unaware of the great tragedy that happened right under his nose, even with the birds singing it on repeat, that it's rather disconcerting. He decides to happily go outside to visit the songbird, who drops the golden chain around his neck, like a gift from the heavens. 
He rushes in to show the family his treasure and finds his wife is so terrified that she's fallen to the floor in desperation. The bird keeps singing his accusatory song, which makes her wish she were thousands of fathoms below the earth so she could not hear it. The telltale song doesn't seem to bother anybody else, and the sister is curious if the bird will give her something. She goes outside and the bird tosses the new red shoes at her. Happily, she goes inside to show off the treasure. The song continues and it's reached a fever pitch in the mother's head, who decides that she feels so terrible that maybe going outside to see the majestic, generous bird might make her feel better. No sooner does the mother step over the threshold than the gigantic, heavy millstone falls on top of her head, smashing it to pieces and crushing her to death. The father and sister hear the crash and go out to investigate. I'm not sure if they see her mangled form, but what they do see is smoke, fire, and flames rising, and out of that, the little brother in his human form, reanimated. He takes his father and sister's hands and, happily, considering the situation, I guess, they go back inside, sit at the table, and eat. Hopefully not the mother, but the father has acquired a taste for that sort of thing <laughs> recently. Anyway, the end. That was the Juniper Tree from Germany, a version collected by the Grimms. Believe it or not, there are versions of this that do not end as well, well. In fact, in most of them, the little child never returns. For instance, this next story follows the Juniper Tree very closely, but starts off quite disturbingly different. Now, I'll leave it to you to decide which of these tales is more morbid. In the Rose Tree from England, instead of a little boy to be jealous of, it's a little girl who's white as milk and with lips like cherries and has golden hair that hangs to the ground from a previous marriage. The stepmother punishes her with so much work and one day sends the girl out to get candles. Simple enough, but unfortunately the girl has to put the candles down in order to cross the stile, which is when a dog zips by and snatches them up. The candles are made with animal fat, irresistible. The girl returns home empty-handed. This happens twice more. The girl spends the money but returns candleless. The stepmother is furious, but hides her anger. Come, lay your head in my lap, then I might comb your hair. So she lays her head in the woman's lap, her hair falling over her knees and rolling right down to the ground, just like Rapunzel. The stepmother hated her more for the beauty of her hair, so she said to her, I cannot part your hair on my knee. Fetch a billet of wood. So she fetched it. Then, said the stepmother, I cannot part your hair with a comb, fetch me an axe. So she fetched it. Now, said the woman, lay your head down on the wood while I part your hair. Naively, she laid down her little golden head without fear. Down came the axe and it was off. The stepmother wiped the axe and laughed. <laughs> that tangled hair combing scene will never be the same again. But back in this story, the stepmother only cooks the heart and liver, feeds the family, but the son refuses to eat. Father says it tastes very strange, but from this point on, the story essentially follows the juniper tree exactly. You can hear the full reading of the rose tree story here. And this particularly dark children's fairy tale is told in other places too. There are versions from Austria, Hungary, another from England, Scotland, and Romania has a version that oddly dovetails with the story of Hansel and Gretel. And of course, there are mythological roots as well. I hope you enjoyed these grim fairy tales, if enjoyed is the right word. Let me know if you'd like to see more dark fairy tales on the channel by commenting below. And do subscribe so you won't miss what's uh, stewing next. Goodbye!